in order for you to appreciate John's introduction, I feel it's appropriate that I tell you a little story that happened when John Jones first was exposed to our guest instructor, Arden Hopkin. The Callers Association was having a meeting. Arden was given several records to play and to critique. Arden did not know the names of any of the callers on the record, and he had picked out some good records and some bad records and would comment on the techniques and styles. One of the records he happened to pick up was on a Kalox label featuring none other than our chairman, John Jones. And Arden's comment after listening to the record for just a little while was, this sounds like a caller who is in love with his own voice. <laughs> chairman John Jones. And when the laughter died down, I said, you're right. <laughs> I know that you're all going to enjoy these sessions that Arden is going to do. As you know, I have heard him before. I was apprehensive about how good a voice instructor would be for us square dance callers, especially someone who knew nothing particularly about square dancing. But after I listened to him and heard his session, I really felt like it would be something that we could all benefit from here at Caller Lab. He understands the operation of what we do. And because of his profession, Ours is very closely related in that we use our voice. And without our voice, as all of you know, we're nothing as a square dance caller. Arden was born in Laramie, Wyoming, and he was raised in Palo Alto, California. He has a bachelor's degree from Brigham Young University, a master's degree from North Texas State University, and a doctor's degree from the School of Music, Eastern School of Music. He is a professional singer. He has done musical comedy, and among some of those have been Oklahoma, Camelot, and Man of La Mancha. He has done opera companies in New York and Texas, concerting, concertizing, pardon me, from Canada throughout the United States and South America. He's a member of the National Association of Teachers of Singing, head of the vocal studies, and opera director at Texas, Texas Christian University in Fort Worth, Texas. His other skills include opera directing in the United States and Canada. He's married, has five sons, enjoys sports of all kinds, He enjoys cub and boy scouting. He's active in church activities, and he loves to sleep whenever possible. <laughs> Incidentally, I might add that these sessions are going to be continuation sessions of going from one to another, and they will not be exact repeats. There's going to be quite a bit of critiquing this afternoon in both the sessions, there's, we're going to ask for volunteers in that regard, and if you don't volunteer, then we'll appoint you, as we have done those who are going to be critiqued this morning after Arden gives his opening comments and the background of what he's going to talk about. Then he's going to go into the critiquing-type session, and it's very good. So don't be bashful if you wish to be critiqued, because we need, we've got to have guinea pigs to critique on, 
And uh, I haven't asked anyone, but I think it would be nice if we could have one of our lady callers to get in on one of the sessions this afternoon. I think that would be of aid to some of those who are here as well. But would you please welcome Mr. Arden Hopkins, Professor. I feel real pleased to be here with you today. I sat in on the session just of preceding this one and was, uh, I have to say, I was really touched by what I saw. I really, really felt at ease and at home, enjoyed watching the dancers, enjoyed the spirit of the companionship that seemed to be here. I was impressed by the fact that uh, I didn't see people dressed up like me. <laughs> in other words, I didn't see any uh, ties and uh, white shirts and... Everybody seemed to be relaxed. I couldn't tell if you were doctors or lawyers or uh, pharmacists or electricians or plumbers or farmers or anything. You just look like people. And I don't get that privilege very often because in my business, uh, which is opera, I get to be surrounded by people who want everybody to know how much money they have. And since I don't have very much, I don't like to be in that company very well. <laughs> And, and so I feel right at home. <laughs> well, I appreciated the introduction, and uh, uh, poor John, I, we had that zinger that I gave to John was just sort of accidental a long time ago, and I've heard that there are four or five callers that have been set up for me this morning in the hopes that... Uh, probably in the hopes that I might zing them too, but I'm not. that was just sort of an accident, so I'm not going to be looking for that. <clears throat> I have five sons, which means that I don't get to sleep very much, so I always look forward to going to convention so that I can get a good night's sleep, and to sleep in too, and as a matter of fact, I didn't let anybody know that I was here when I came in last night, I just went to my room and t turned the lights off and crawled in the bed and knew I wasn't going to be up with either the puppy or the children about 5.30 in the morning. But I got a call <laughs> uh, before I was ready to get up to, to let me know that the day had begun and it was time to get up. And so I w aroused myself and crawled into the shower and about that time the desk called me to tell me that it's time to wake up. <clears throat> I do enjoy all kinds of sports and I know that you folks got a chuckle out of that one especially following on the fact that I have five sons. And uh, I just have to tell a story on myself or two. I'm uh, active in the Mormon church, and as most of you know, Mormons don't drink or smoke. Um, and so my friends always chide me that I don't have most of the human vices, so I make up for it in other ways, and that's how I ended up with a <laughs> large family. Um, I'm supposed to be an expert on this subject of uh, vocal training, and I, I think you all deserve to know the definition of an expert. If you break that word down, it breaks into two parts, ex spurt. And uh, if you define what the word ex means, it means somebody that used to be, or in the vernacular, a has-been. And if you define the word spurt, it's a drip under pressure. So I, I think I fulfill that. I'm a has-been drip under pressure. Furthermore, um, you notice that I have a bachelor's degree and a master's degree and a doctor's degree. And you've also heard it said that people go crazy by degrees, and that's sort of what's <laughs> happened to me. What I want to do this today, particularly this morning, is to give you an overview of how your voices work, um, tell you a little bit about what makes them work, impress you with how much I know so that I can get away with exposing my ignorances later on when it comes to, to critiquing what you already know how to do. I want to give you a full description of the anatomy of your singing voice and your speaking voice. I want to... Uh, have you experienced some exercises? Uh, we're going to turn this into a great big voice lesson this morning. 
and have you find out a little bit about your voice. And then I want to open it up for some troubleshooting. I want some of you to be thinking about the things that give you the greatest difficulty in your calling. And uh, we'll, I'll field some questions from the floor and uh, try to answer them. Maybe get to the person who asks the question up here to serve as a guinea pig. Don't let that stand in your way of asking the questions. If, if you're bashful, I'll let you stay where you are and you can guinea pig from wherever you are. And then, time permitting, we'll go on to the critique of the lab callers, the, the callers that are going to be coming up here a little bit later. So I suspect that those four or five will be full of questions uh, to postpone that as long as possible. I had hoped that I wouldn't have to face quite so many of you at this early hour because I'm going to get you up and have you waving your arms around. And if you don't already know your neighbors, would you mind turning around and introducing yourselves because you're going to be uh, invading each other's space for a while here. Now that sounds like a very, very healthy noise. I'm not really sure why I'm here. It sounds like all of you already know how to use your voices very well. The first thing I want to do is to get you up out of your chairs. Would you all stand up? The first thing a person has to be able to do in order to make a good singing sound is to stand up straight. I think most of you qualify for that. I don't see anybody that's doubled over too badly. And as a matter of fact, it's even possible to sing while you're sitting down. But anyway, the first important thing is that you've got to be able to release tensions that all of us carry around in our bodies and take pressure off of the muscles that produce the sounds that you make. Everybody's wondering now what, what is correct body posture, and I see some of the men straightening their shoulders already in anticipation of what I'm going to say next. But really, posture is a very simple thing for you to work on. If you don't have a big chest, it doesn't matter. If you're a little bit sway, sway back like I am, it really isn't too serious. If you have a bit of a stomach, that's not too serious either. The most important elements of, <laughs> at least not for singing, The most important elements to keep in mind are that your ear should be aligned over your shoulder, which should be aligned over your hip, which should be aligned over your knee, which should be aligned over your ankle. So that if you see somebody standing like this, or like this, Or, they're going to have a little bit of a hard time making good use of the muscles that make them sing. So in other words, you don't have to stand in military posture in order to have good posture. Simple, relaxed posture. Shoulders at ease. Now, the reason that you need to do this is because the major muscles that, that produce breath and you have to have breath in order to sing or speak, the major muscles that produce that breath are right down in here, in your solar plexus region. All of your body is set up in combinations of muscles. The combination of muscles that control breathing are the diaphragm. The diaphragm is a muscle that looks like an inverted bowl, and it sits right underneath your rib cage. When it's in its relaxed position, it looks like an upside down bowl and it goes all the way through your body, divides your chest cavity from your abdominal cavity. And there's a little hole that goes right down through it to let the esophagus, the, 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 what is that, the esophagus, anyway, to let the food down into your stomach. So when that muscle exercises itself, it flexes downward. Would each of you put your hand right here on the solar plexus, that's that little triangular region of where your rib cage climbs upward. If you'll put your hand right on top of that and take in a deep breath, you should feel that area expand. 
What you're really feeling there is the thickening of your abdomen, uh, your, of your diaphragm. Now breathe in very slowly through your nose. If that part of your body doesn't work yet at this hour of the morning, let's do something to wake it up. Okay? Now once you've got your breath in, everybody take in a very slow breath. You think you're as full as you can be? Take in a little bit more. You think you're as full as you can be? Take in a little bit more. Now is everybody's diaphragm working? Okay. Another, t another way that you can find your diaphragm at work is to go out and run a mile. And then it's amazing how well that diaphragm does all by itself. But we have these heavy muscles and heavy bones in our rib cage. So that if those bones and those muscles sag down onto the diaphragm, and the diaphragm connects right down here at the bottom of the ribs, if those muscles sag deep and low over the diaphragm, it serves just about the same purpose as wrapping your arms in a straitjacket. It doesn't allow the diaphragm the freedom of movement. So slouching posture is one of the most critical things that you want to correct, and you can correct that on your own. You don't need anybody else's help. You just need to stand up straight and get those ribs open and away from the diaphragm. Now you're saying to yourself, I think I've got it, but am I really sure? Let me show you how you can find that out. Now put your fingers right on your shoulders. Now, yes, exactly right. Try to point your elbows at the ceiling now. Now, what does that do to your rib cage? <laughs> I heard somebody say, <laughs> You ought to see what you guys look like from up here. <laughs> This is actually a session of the Audubon Society. This has nothing to do with <laughs> Next on the program, we're going to learn how to make the duck call. <laughs> I want you to do this again. Now, take your elbows and your shoulders and put them down by, uh, drop them. Put your arms down by your sides, but don't drop your rib cage. Put your arms down, but leave your rib cage expanded. Now take this part of these muscles right through here and relax them. Ah, everybody's shoulders dropped about two inches. That's just right. That gives you a feeling of what your rib cage should feel like when it's expanded. Now, if it's, when it's expanded, you all look very much better. <laughs> uh, the ladies look terrific, especially. <laughs> When your rib cage is expanded, it releases your diaphragm so that it can work in a very relaxed and normal fashion. The diaphragm takes breath in, but the diaphragm can't push breath out. I guess I ought to ask, have any of you, raise your hand, have any of you had voice lessons before? Well, okay, now I'm going to have to watch what I say. I've got to tell you the truth now, because there's some people that can tell you otherwise. <clears throat> The diaphragm, like any other muscle in your body, can only work in one direction. Muscles work by contraction. Muscles have no power to push. For example, your bicep pulls your arm inward this way. I think, yeah, so that's right. That's, <laughs> it pulls your arm inward. Now, if I want my arm to go back out, the bicep has no part in that activity. The tricep pulls my arm back out. In essence, the diaphragm pulls air into your lungs by creating an imbalance in air pressure. You have a cavity, an empty cavity inside your body, which are your lungs. Air pressure is balanced. When the diaphragm pulls down, it creates an imbalance in the pressure. There's a greater space, not as much air to fill it. The, the air pressure outside doesn't like uh, imbalance, and therefore, automatically, it will, the air will seek to balance that semi-vacuum in your lungs. If you close your mouth, you plug your nose, it'll try to get in through your eyeballs or your ears, but it's going to come in one way or another. In other words, you don't have to pull air into your body. It will go in by itself as long as there's some opening for it to get in. So as soon as the diaphragm contracts, your lungs will fill with air. Now how do you get the air back out again? Your diaphragm can't do that. Or better said, it can do it just a little bit, because as it relaxes, it goes back up into place. As it goes back up into place, it displaces the air just a little bit, but with no sense of pressure. 
to sing or to speak takes a certain amount of pressure. What muscles do you use to, to accomplish that? All of us have a girdle of muscles that go around our body that begin up here just beneath our rib cage and go down to about our pelvic bone and they connect right back here at our back. And this abdominal girdle of muscles, as it contracts inward, it forces your stomach and your upper intest intestines up underneath that diaphragm and it provides some support for the diaphragm so that when the diaphragm relaxes and goes back into place, it has some power behind it. And those sets of muscles work together. Now I know that some people's girdle of muscles are small and some people's girdle of muscles are quite large, but they all work just about the same. Let me show you how they work. Would you all put your hand on your abdomen and cough? <laughs> no, just once. That's all you need. I got somebody started. That's right. You felt what the muscle activity was. There was a certain amount of contraction when it happened. Now would you all put your hands on your mouth like this, stop off the mouth completely, and then blow hard while you put your hand on your abdomen. Correct. You feel the muscles contract. The funny thing is, is that those muscles already know what they're doing. They learned how to do that a long time ago. Everything that I'm telling you today, you already know how to do. You just don't realize that you know how to do it. And that has to do with all singing sounds. You know, ever wonder why it takes a child so long to learn how to talk? They really, it takes them until, oh, three or four years old until they're really expert at knowing how to talk. And particularly the time between six months and two years, they make some incredible sounds. All of us went through that. All of us learned how to use the muscles that produce sound completely. It's just that we've forgotten how to do that. But I'm going to try to remind you of circumstances where you use all of the sets of muscles uh, in everyday living that you're ever going to need to use in singing and already know, to ha know how to use them very, very well. You just have never made the connection between singing and speaking and, and, and doing what you're doing. Now go ahead and relax. Sit down for a second. The muscles that control breathing, then, are the diaphragm and the abdominal muscles. In everyday living, we use a very, very small portion of uh, the capacity for air that we, we have available to us. Um, the diaphragm just sort of does a little in and out thing. We can hardly feel it moving. When you get into singing, that activity needs to exaggerate, and therefore it may feel a little bit strange to you. So you've got to have a source of air pressure in order to produce sound. The next step along the way as you move up your body, you get to the throat or the larynx. And that's where the raw sound is produced. And believe me, it is raw sound. When you get a sound that comes out of your throat without any resonances on it, it sounds something like this. Uh, if you were able to stick a microphone down your throat and catch those sounds, they would be just that rough sounding in their initial unpolished stages. However, we have some other things, some resonators that help to make that sound become more attractive. The muscles that are in your throat that produce sound are involuntary muscles. That is, you can't say to your vocal cords, work. You can't say to your vocal cords, consciously, change pitch. They don't know how to do that. They don't respond on that mechanism. They are reflexive muscles. So therefore, when you try to make them work, you have to sort of come at it around the circle. And if any of you, those of you that have taken voice lessons, know how silly voice lessons can get to be sometimes. Uh, I've had teachers tell me, well, your voice is supposed to feel like a waterfall that comes up over the water wheel and the sound falls off. Well, now, you stop and think about that analogy, and that doesn't make any sense at all. But it does, only in the sense that if you can get a picture of what you're trying to accomplish, you have a better chance of doing it than if you give orders to your vocal cords to make them work. Just like in the breathing process, there are two sets of muscles that control the uh, phonating process. 
uh, and here's where I get to sound like I know what I'm talking about. There is a cricothyroid muscle that connects back in your larynx, and then there are the vocalis muscles. Now, the cricothyroid muscles take these little bands uh, that look almost like rubber bands, pieces of flesh, elastic pieces of flesh that are your vocal cords or vocal folds or the flesh that make up your voice. Anyway, they take those things, uh, which uh, this is going to be a little bit hard for me to do, so I'll step out away from the podium in the hopes that you can see what I'm doing. I am now a larynx, okay? I'm not me. I'm a larynx. And here is the front of the larynx, the Adam's apple. My fingers are the larynx. If you were to be able to look down your throat, and my arms are the vocal cords, if you were able to look down my throat, you would see that the vocal cords sit apart, and that's so that you can breathe. The air can get past that little obstruction. Now, when the vocalis muscles, or, or when the cricothyroid muscles work, they, come, they bring my elbows together, and they close the vocal cords. And as they begin to work, they stretch the vocal cords just like you were going to stretch a guitar string or any other substance like an uh, elastic substance to make it longer and thinner. And when it does that, the vocal cords produce different pitches, pitch being produced by the mass of uh, flesh there that's vibrating and also the length of the vocal cords. So anyway... The one set of muscles pulls the vocal cords together and, and stretches them long, closes them off. As soon as they're closed, I really can't simulate this because my elbows aren't knock-kneed, uh, bow-legged, but my legs are. So let's pretend that you're looking at my legs now, and my legs are the, are the vocal bands. When they're pulled together by the cricothyroid muscles, they stay bowed in the middle, just like my knees are. And you produce a sound a little bit like this... And it doesn't have much energy in it because there's a lot of air escaping. The, and just part, part of the vocal cords are vibrating. A lot of wastage going on there. Do any of you have that problem where you make sounds that just don't quite sound terribly efficient? This is a uh, sound often associated with milk toast husbands. Any of you fit into that category? <laughs> At any rate, that, that sound is associated with... A, it has nothing to do with your personality. It has to do with whether or not your vocal cords are working. Anyway, the other set of muscles then starts to pull in opposition. The one set of muscles is stretching the vocal cords long to make them thinner, to make the pitch go up. Now you've got another set of muscles that works in direct opposition to that, and they're the vocalis muscles, and they are the vocal cords themselves. And when they start to contract, they get thicker, like all muscles do, and as they contract, they pull together so that your, no, your vocal cords are no longer bow-legged, but are completely closed. And when they're closed they cut off the air supply completely. And as the sound, as the breath comes up out of your throat, it starts at the bottom of the vocal cords and it blows the vocal cords apart just a little bit. And then it pops loose at the, be at the open, at the top. And when it does that, it makes a little sound like... Only it happens at many hundreds and thousands of cycles per second, so you get a pitch out of it. There's a little pop that happens every time the vocal cords come apart. And as they come apart, they immediately close again because there's some tension. So your vocal cords work a little bit like clapping hands, only they happen so fast that it produces a pitch. I've seen pictures of this, and it looks terribly violent. <laughs> but it really does make some, uh, some very nice sounds. So just pretend that you haven't seen that. And, and your vocal cords, that's, that's the scientific explanation of what's happening in your throat. But you can't control that, except through subconscious means. You already have learned how to do that from an infant, making noise, exploring the different possibilities available. So that phonation is, is created by a breath supply and by some vibrators that create resistance and vibrate as the breath goes through it, and that sound is not at all attractive. To help that sound become attractive, you have some resonators, and the resonators are your upper throat, called the pharynx, that's the spot from back where, you, where the throat begins to go out of the mouth and down into the throat, up to where the 
the roof of your mouth is, and the mouth proper, and then your sinuses. Those three areas are, are available to you to modify the sound that you make. Now, I'm going to have you do some exercises here in a little while to explore all of those little chambers. So as I said, you need to be pretty good friends with each other. There are some obstacles to resonance. In other words, there are some obstacles to letting the sound get out from inside of you. And that is where I think most people have the greatest difficulty in uh, doing any kind of singing or speaking. The greatest problem is in the tongue. The tongue connects back down around behind your throat. You can't see the base of your tongue, and it comes up out of your throat and hooks and is connected or touches behind your lower front teeth most of the time. But the tongue isn't just one muscle, it's a, a weird little animal that's made up of about seven different muscles all lumped together. And it can get extremely tense, even to the point of blocking off your throat so that no sounds will come out. And when, when you have problems with that, most frequently a voice teacher will start taking a look at your tongue and seeing what's happening. Another uh, problem area is the soft palate. Now, if everybody will take the, your tongue and run it across the roof of your mouth on the inside, you'll come toward the back to a point where it quits being hard and it starts getting soft, and you'll discover your soft palate if you didn't know where it was already. And, and connected to the soft palate is a uvula that sticks down your throat a little bit. Those fleshy things, those soft fleshy things, the soft palate and the tongue, can serve just like a, a set of curtains. If you close curtains uh, around somebody who's singing, singing, it'll make the sound muffled. And in the same way, if those things get in the way, they'll make the sound sound muffled and diffused and unattractive. And uh, we'll get at that again a little bit later. Your ears connect inside your body right up behind the soft palate. The eustachian tube connects back in there. And one of the real problems that most singers have is that they love to listen to themselves sing. They love to listen to themselves sing through their inner ear. They don't hear themselves as everybody else hear them, hears them. They hear themselves before the sound ever gets out of their mouth. And it becomes very attractive to them. And it sounds big and wonderful. Only trouble is they use their tongue to hold the sound in the back of their mouth so that it'll, the sound will go up through their inner ear into their um, eardrum and they'll get this magnificent sound. Only trouble is they don't share that sound with anybody else and what's left over for the audience out there is pretty dull. That's a problem that singers of all kinds have and I will probably confront that several times during the day. So if I say you're listening to yourselves through your inner ear that means that you're holding the sound back inside so that it sounds nice and rich and dark. And you can already tell that that's not very attractive to somebody else listening to it. But, oh, it sounds good to me. Now, you, I've been able to get you to the point where you've got some breath flowing. I've got you to the point where you've made some sort of a sound, however ugly. And you've now taken that sound and made it into something. But it's still not coherent. It's still not such that you can organize it. If we left it at that point, I would be able to talk like this, and you wouldn't be able to tell me because there's no articulation in it. There needs to be articulation. The sounds need to be organized into speech patterns, and there's where the articulators come in. Your tongue is an articulator, your teeth, your heart, the hard palate, your lips. They each produce interrupters to the sound, and they shape it. The first thing is the vowels. Your tongue shapes vowels depending on whether it's flat in your mouth or arched in your mouth or grooved or swallowed, it'll produce a different kind of a vowel. After that vowel is started in motion, it still needs to be further subdivided into words, and words are done by putting consonants on. And consonants really are simply interruptions to the sound, and we get that all organized, and hopefully we can understand each other. So that's it. Now I can go home now, and I hope you all have a nice day. That's how your voice works. Now, see, that's, that's very simple. Um, you wonder why uh, people take voice lessons for years and years and years, and they still don't know what they're doing. 
But singing is just like any other physical activity. It's not how much you know in your brain, it's how much you can do with your muscles. Those of you that have ever shot a basketball, try to remember back the first time that you picked that basketball up and tried to shoot it at the hoop and how many feet you missed it by. Because the muscles didn't know how to balance with each other to uh, throw that ball in an arc in such a way that it would go through the hoop. And if you stop and think about it, that's not a very easy thing to do. It's a very complex activity. And if, if there were a fellow that said, let's see, I need to send that ball out at a 45 degree angle over a 15 foot arc so that it will come down descending on a 75 degree angle so that it will clear the rim, you can count on the fact that he's not going to make that basket because his mind's too busy. And the same thing happens with singing. If you worry and think about it too much, it just won't happen. The way that you do it is just to do it. The more you do it, the better you get at it. And that, that has to do with whether you're doing it under somebody's tutelage or whether you're doing it by yourself. The more you use your voices, the better the voices will become, particularly if you have a basic understanding of how your voice works. Your, your subconscious mind is an imitator. It imitates other people that it likes. Other people make a nice sound. You say, hmm, I wonder how they did that. And you start fussing around, and before you know it, you can make a sound like them somewhat. Your, your mind has to have an image of what, what's going on. And that's what I've tried to do so far this morning, is just to give you an image of how all of this works. Okay, now on to the fun. I want to show you how you develop these skills. Get back up now, and I'll uh, have you do some breathing exercises. First, you've got to flap your wings a little bit here and get your rib cage up. Now drop your arms and relax your shoulders. I want you to take in a deep breath over the count of four. Very slow counts. Go. One, two, three, four. Let it out. Now what I saw happen was this. One, two, three, four. And if I'd gone to six, they would have floated to the ceiling. The truth of the matter is, is that that's not the way that you get the most efficient breathing. If your ribs are already up, they shouldn't be able to go up more. So lo and behold, some of you are not used to having your rib cages up. Rather, try to feel like you're expanding like a barrel down here below. Some of you will do this better than others. <laughs> try it. One, two, three. Four. Now, you should take all four of those counts to get full of breath. You can let your breath out now. Try it again. One, two, three, four. Now, hold on to it. Two, three, four. Now, let it out slowly. One, two, three, four. And you should just sort of roll the air out from underneath. Don't feel like your chest is going to collapse and give way. Try it again. One, two, three, four. Four, hold on to it. Let it out. One, two, three, four. Now, if you stopped right at this point and never sang a note in your life, this would be a good thing for you to know. Um, those of you that subscribed to the Reader's Digest in last month's issue have read an article about breathing for better health and how breathing like I'm just showing will help you relax, get rid of tension, get rid of toxins that are built up in your body through this breathing process. So see, you're already healthy people as a result of this, or more so. So in slow, pause, breathe out slowly. Now I want you to breathe in quick in the count of one. Go. Whoops, not this. <sighs> Instead, <sighs> now did you see anything happen? Maybe John did. Did you anybody else see this happen? No, it's down here. It's where the diaphragm lives, and that's where the work's done. Try it again. It'll work if you'll open your mouth. You'll get more air in. Try it. I guess I'll let, you air, let your air out in between. <laughs> okay, you all empty. Now let's try it. Breathe quick. Like this. You all sound asthmatic this morning. <laughs> if this happens to you... <gasps> That means your throat isn't relaxed. The throat's already closed. See if you can do it this way. No sound when you breathe in. Try it. 
All right, that, see how easy that is? Hold on to it for a second. Now breathe out slowly. One, two, three, four. Now to, to help you in this, I want to have you, whenever I ask you to breathe out, I want you to form the letter S so that we can see, we can hear the sound exhaling. Breathe in quickly. Now that's still asthmatic. Let's try it again. Quiet, please. Go. Hold it. Form an S. Now I'm going to have you go to six counts and see if you can survive that. Breathe in quickly. No, that's asthmatic. Let's try it again. Go. Hold it. Breathe out six counts. One, two, try to use all of your air up in six, four, five, six. Good. Well, no, no, that's enough. You're getting ahead now. We're going to go up to eight counts. Breathe in quickly. Hold it. Go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Some of you made it. There is either some lady that's very used to this over here. Spends a lot of time on the telephone, maybe. That's what it is. You need to be able to have breath usage, oh, for five, six, seven, eight seconds. Have control of your breath. Now, I suspect that when we get around to question and answer period, that some of you are going to say, I always run out of breath when I'm calling and I need some help on how to do that. This is one of the exercises you can use to liberate your breathing. If your breathing is locked in a straitjacket by bad posture, you won't have any luck. You need to think of your breath not as being put under pressure by the muscles that you use, but as already being under pressure the minute you breathe it, because your lungs are like balloons. They're elastic. They'll want to get rid of the breath. The diaphragm will want to relax and get back into normal posture. It's going to put a little pressure on your voice. So if you think of your voice as being already under pressure, you'll be a whole lot better off. Let's see, am I blabbing on too long? Oh, shoot, I've got to hurry this along. Okay, uh, the next thing I want you to do is, is to work through the phonating process. Oh, no, one more breathing exercise. This is a lot of fun. I want you to pant like a dog. <laughs> try to do it quietly and try to confine your activities to down here at the bottom of your ribs. Okay, let's do it this way. In, out, in, out, in, out, in, out, in, out, in, out. Da, 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 Okay, on away from breathing to phonation. Would you all sigh for me? Ah, doesn't that feel good? Try it again. Ah, all right, now take where you thought you were pitch wise and sigh a little higher, like this. Ah, 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 ah. That's right, very good. Now that puts those vocal cords together in a very gentle fashion. Now, what I want you to do is to feel what it feels like before you yawn. You say, what? Before I yawn? Well, there's that split second before you actually go into your yawn when... to yell at your children, the kind of voice that you use when you go to the office and want to impress people. Then there's the other voice, more a head voice, and it's the voice that you use when you're trying to wheedle something out of your husband or wife, or you're going in for a raise, or, or when you're trying to be kind to your children, or you're stroking your puppy, or something like that. And it's a much more gentle, softer tone. 
The ideal vocal sound is a combination of both of those things. Most people do either one or the other. And most of us just use the heavier, chesty voice. Or in the case of some women, they just use the light head voice, which is made up of the uh, cricothyroid muscles. But we need to mix those. And that's what this yawning and sighing helps accomplish, is a combination of those two sounds in a nice balanced pattern. There's one more little thing that I'd like to have you try to do, and it's called a free tone, or a, in German, a fry tone. And it sounds like this. Uh, try that. It should not sound like this. Uh, it shouldn't be a, a tone that you'd sing. It should be a rattle in your throat. Uh, that's terrific. That's great. That is another way that you can use to relax the throat muscles, particularly the muscles that produce sound. Now, if you can do that, fry tone, and then bleed it over into a sung tone, that will give you the feeling of what a relaxed singing tone should feel like, like this. You try that. Great. I think we'll take this on tour. It sounds wonderful. <laughs> now take that fry tone and start to go higher, even up into the high top of your voice, like this. Try it. Good. Very good. Now, when you do that, you'll discover that those high notes aren't nearly as tense as they can be sometimes. And the whole, uh, whole point is to keep your voice relaxed all the way through. People get this mental image of tones. And you start down on the low notes, and those tones are relatively easy and close together. But as you start to go higher, those tones get to be like taking two steps and three steps at once on the climbing stairs, you know. And after a while, when you get up to the top of your voice, the distance between the next to the top note and the top note is like three quarters of a mile. But the truth of the matter is that all of those tones are produced by little muscles and the difference physically between those tones is just fractions of inches, almost immeasurable. So your, your feelings, your fear of flying has to do with a psychological problem more than it is a physical problem. Then when you get nervous and tense in your mind, these muscles get nervous and tense and they don't do what they're supposed to. Okay, resonation. There are bunches of different sounds that you can make with your voice, as I just described to you. You can sob and cry, which has to do with using the back part of your throat. Or you can whine and wheedle and beg, which has to do with using your sinuses. Or you can shout, which has to do with using your mouth. And the combination of those different sounds produces the different tones, colors, that we want to use to either get our way with our husband or wife, or to get a raise, or to shout at our children. We use all of those different sounds. The singing sound can be varied depending on what you want to say. Okay, I'll run right on past that and get now to uh, troubleshooting. Go ahead and have a seat. Let me ask for some hands from the audience to see if there are some problems that might want to be addressed from the floor, things that you might have difficulty with in your calling. Hand in the back. Good. That's a problem. The question is how, you all heard it for the purpose of the tape, I'm going to repeat the question. How do you uh, go from your chest voice, that heavy sound, into the top without cracking or breaking over into a semi-falsetto sound that's uncontrollable? Some of the exercises that I just gave you this, this morning should help to do this. The free tone uh, should be used or can be used and 
you can take that and gradually step higher, like this. And so on. Trying to keep your throat relaxed and have it feel like it felt when you were rattling on that free tone. The other thing that you can do is this yawning and sighing that I just talked about. Ah, 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 because what that does is take those two sets of muscles and work them in coordination. Your vocalis muscles control the chest voice, the cricothyroid muscles control the, the top voice. And those two muscles have to work in tandem with each other. Probably what's happening to you is that you're spending all of your time in that chest voice area exclusively. Then when it comes time to go higher, there has to be a transition, just like passing the baton in a relay race, and the baton gets dropped. But if you can just take that head voice feeling and get used to what that feels like and let it be included in your sound, that should take some of the pressure off of your sound. The voice, when it's used properly, should give you no feeling of pressure. When you're singing or calling, you should have a feeling like you're selling newspapers on the street corner. Extra, extra, read all about it. And because that's a very projected kind of tone, and I feel that right around my nose and right around my teeth and not in the back part of my mouth. And that also is another element that can help control that problem. The less weight that you have on your voice, the easier the transition between the, the two sets of muscles will be. The more weight there is, the greater chance there is that those muscles will fall apart from each other when they're both at their weakest juncture point. Now that sounds really smart, Alec, but that's really what happens. Okay. We've got about 20 minutes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, how quickly do you want to get better? <laughs> the question is, how frequently should you do these exercises and how long? And my answer is, you heard, how quickly do you want to make a change? It's just like anything else. The more you do it, the quicker it will become habitual to you. The less frequently you do it, the longer it will take to make the transition over. I would think in the early stages you shouldn't do more than about 15 minutes at a time, but if you can get 8 or 10, 15 minute sessions in a day, that's great. And if you can't, whatever you can get is good. Okay, uh, one more question, two more questions, and then we'll go to critiques. <coughs> that? No. There isn't. I mean, there's a, you can sort of suck up from above. You all know how to do that, where you suck phlegm out of your throat a little bit. But that always doesn't take the, the phlegm off of the vocal cords themselves. A very light cough <coughs> without sound is the best way to do it. And then if you can't get it out that way, then you just have to go ahead and cough it up. If you've got a cold, most people sing heavier when they've got a cold because they think it takes weight off of their throat. And that's just exactly wrong. The more that you can get it up into your nose, the better off you'll be. Now, most Americans are deathly afraid of nasal sounds because if, whether you know it or not, our language is by nature a guttural language. Uh, you think of German or you think of Russian. No, oh, it sounds like it's coming out of the back of their throat. The truth of the matter is, is that English is even more guttural, particularly American English, is even more guttural than either of those languages. Most of us do not use our sinuses. Now, the gentleman that was calling this morning did very well at using that. And so if you get a slightly nasal twang in your tone, that will take a lot of pressure off of your vocal cords, particularly if those vocal cords are inflamed and swollen with a cold. One more question in the back, the gentleman in the red shirt. <laughs> you all heard that question. I, the question is, if I forget the words, how do I yodel? Well, you know, I know, I've never had that experience. I'm notorious at forgetting words in foreign languages, and I just make them up as I go, and you'd be amazing. 
most Americans can't speak the foreign languages that I'm trying to work in anyhow, so if I just make something up, but you're working in English, and supposedly you're being articulate enough so that the dancers can understand your words, so they're going to know when you forget a word. If you want to yodel, you need to take those two sets of muscles that I was talking about, and instead of trying to blend them together, you need to exaggerate their differences. Ah, and just flip back and forth between the head voice and the chest voice. You exaggerate the chest voice and you exaggerate the head voice and let that juncture point not be smooth and blended between them. Okay, now let's get on to some critiques. Is uh, Colin Walton in here? Is it, everybody be sure and pass on to him that he said that English sound was guttural. No, uh, this, has, this has nothing to do with the words that you use. I'm not talking about gutter language. I'm talking about... Marshall Flippo, you're first. Do we get to have some dancers with this, or are they just going to call? No, they don't need any dancers. Okay. I didn't have any when you critiqued me. I didn't even really know he was there. It was off of a record that I was working. He was back in the back somewhere. Then he made me get up and do it live. Yeah. Are you sleepy? Would you mind sleeping through this? <laughs> I have been. I have had some experience as just a square dancer, and there have been some callers who I did sleep through, but I don't think I will through yours. <laughs> I don't use it. Now, we all know that being in this situation is much different than calling a dance. When you got people out on the floor that you're calling to, they're busy doing what you're telling them to, and they're not sitting out there like a set of vultures. <laughs> Waiting for a sick chicken to die, you know. I'm going to get some more of my short friends. We're going to beat the hell out of you. <laughs> now, before you start, Marshall, before you start, would you just say something over the microphone? Say something. Say something. Now listen to, that, listen to that sound that he's making. It isn't coming out like this. It isn't coming out round and mellifluous and swallowed. It's coming out very well placed up in the, in the front of his nose. <laughs> if you want to be a, a real good singer, it doesn't hurt to be Jewish, you know, and have a little extra head start. <laughs> you ready? Four ladies change. You turn the girl and you go on a hand, sit with the left and then. Would you tell me that guy is no good at all? What? <laughs> Oh, he's a good friend, but he's a little getting gray like me, or at least his turned gray. Mine came out. Okay, just call a... Ooh. You know, like Cal said last night, when your knees were shaking, my knees were shaking. Would you use your voice? <laughs>
Actually, actually, Marshall, that was really very good. <laughs> One of the things that I was most impressed about that was how well he managed to keep the sound out of his throat and up into the, the bones of the face, which is called the mask. And when that happens, you don't have to work hardly at all when you make a sound. You don't have to drive your voice. You don't have to push it. Remember, you've got a machine that's projecting your voice. All you've got to do is just stand there and make little bitty sounds. And most of us feel like there is a great big difference between an A vowel and an E vowel. But the truth of the matter is, is when you get up in the mask, it just stays there and you can almost be... You almost don't have to use your lips at all to make the sounds distinctive and understood, and I thought that was very good. How many times have you called that? This record? Yeah, how many times have you called that record? That's the first time I heard it. <laughs> In other words, is this uh, something that's real familiar? I guess so. Let's see. Uh, is this real familiar to you? Where's Al at? He gave it to me last Thanksgiving. And I've called it probably, oh, gee, many Christmas. I don't know. I Lots of times. Uh, a lot of time, yes. All right. Um, would you like would, <laughs> would you like to get it right? <laughs> would you like to take that first thing again and do it as if it were a new experience? One of the things that happens, and it isn't just unique to calling square dances, it happens to opera singers, it happens to musical comedy, especially happens to Las Vegas singers, is that they've done these numbers hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times before, and they get very routine, and so there's no freshness to the sound. It's your turn. Just, just be excited about it. Not nervous. Just it's brand excited. new? Well, I... But I do know the, the you, tune. You, I know the tune. you know the tune and you know the words. But, but it's it, brand new. Every, I know the words to it. Every performer has to make each time he performs seem like it's impromptu, like it's fresh, like it's new, like it's not canned. Well, I, what if I call it? <laughs> no, take that one. You, know, you, you need to take something that you know very, very well and still treat it like it was something that was happening for the first time. Now, it was fresh and new, not stale. Old ladies chain across. You turn the girl and you don't get lost and roll away. Circle on the left, you go. You roll away, circle on the left, go round the way and do a the man with the rain. Okay, that's good. Now, could you hear a difference on that? It wasn't, it wasn't just the way that Marshall said the words either. It was, there was a tone in his voice like, this is new, this is fun, this is fresh. Whereas before, even though it was very, very good, it was, this is routine. This is something that I don't have to think about. My mind can worry about my knock and knees because I don't have to concentrate on what I'm doing. And we do that all the time. I mean, we do that to our children, we do it to us. We sort of only ha are half there. But you, everybody loves to be around somebody who's fresh and alive and fully present at all times. And it gets very, very difficult for performers who are doing memorized routines to keep those fresh. And so, Marshall, that would be the only thing I'd have to say. <laughs> no, so are you. Don, Don? Don Williamson, would you be next, please? Something about uh, when the air conditioning gets on and a person's nervous, it feels like it's about 15 degrees cooler than it really is. I experienced that when I first walked in this morning. Are we ready? Circle there. I know that I'm not your first love. There's been others before me. Walk around your corner, see saw your own, the boy star right around you see. Hey, find the corner, lady, left now man, swing your own and promenade with me. I'm the one that's got you now, that's all that matters to me. 
boy, they've really sent me a list of really fine callers. That really is very good, Don. Very good. Nice sound. I, I'm pleased by this because it shows some, some change in pitches. It's possible, and there are many callers who don't have to have a very wide range because there's a kind of a, um, almost a reciting tone that happens when you're calling. You just shift back and forth between two or three tones, and it, it can become very monotone. But this is a lot of, lot of good music with a lot of range in it. Um, do you like to listen to yourself? I think so. <laughs> One of the things that happens to people who enjoy their own voices is they listen. They begin listening to it through their inner ear. And I, I think that that's a little bit what you're doing. To try and break you of that, would you concentrate on saying every one of those words right here on your front teeth and not feeling it way back in the back of your throat. Because what happens, especially on the word me, as you were singing, instead of me, it came out me, and it, it sounded muffled, just like somebody who was listening through their inner ear instead of letting the, the dancers hear it. Try it again. You'll, you'll discover you won't have to work so hard at it. Put it where? Right on the teeth. Right, right on the front of the teeth. You could almost, as if you were going to take this microphone and you were just going to chew it right there. Chew. Circle F. I know that I'm not your first love. There's been others before me. I'm the one that's got you now. That's all that matters to me. You all heard the difference in that, didn't you? Now, if you were dancing, would you rather hear that? Yeah, because he's singing to you, not to himself, all of a sudden. <laughs> it's very important, people who use electronic equipment. I've had some experience of this in nightclub situations, particularly when people are busy doing something else, in that case drinking, and not paying a bit of attention to the singer. So after a while the singer says, oh, what the heck? And just starts to... And just sing to himself. And then the audience, he just becomes like a music box over there in the corner. Now, callers don't quite have that same problem, but the, the dancers get busy doing their own thing. They're very busy, and he can build a little wall around himself and his record player and uh, create a sense of isolation. And this, this singing to oneself is one of those barriers that will come up between a caller and his dancers that will kind of make the, make the dance go flat on you, go stale without you ever knowing why. Daryl Clendenin, come on. I know that we're getting close to the lunch hour, but would you like to stay just a little bit longer so we can go there? We've got two or three more guinea pigs. <laughs> this is Daryl Plendenin. Daryl? Now, I want you all to know that I'm no great expert. Yes, I am an expert when it comes to, uh, in my original definition, according to uh, square dance calling. I'm just dealing with that information that runs all the way through the performing industry, ranging anywhere from Nashville music to the highest grand opera. It's the same principle that applies everywhere. Tasting, tasting. I'd like to say, I'd like to say that I appreciate the chance to get up here and be critiqued. <laughs> I'd like to say it, but I'm not going to. Ugly like John, you're just a naturally got to be cool. You gotta walk just right and keep your package up tight and don't to break no rules. Or ladies chain will turn them a man. You chain them home from a dead man. Well, when you're ugly like John, you're just a naturally got to be cool. I'm going to use. I'm going to have Daryl do this again, and I'm going to have him. I'm going to have him do it again to demonstrate something that's very positive. I want you to listen very carefully 
particularly those of you that have trouble going up into the top part of your voices. I want you to listen to how he does it. I want you to notice the lack of weightiness in his voice as he's, as he's starting to sing. And when it comes time for him to sing the high notes, how they just kind of pop there. And remember, if you keep weight on your voice by trying to make it sound stentorian or big or virile or whatever, then you're going to create problems for yourselves at the top of your voice. Daryl doesn't have that problem, so I want you to do it again and demonstrate. Just, just do it the way you just did it now and, and let everybody see. He doesn't say swing, which is heavy. Just swing, swing, and it just pops right out. And that's right. And that's just exactly right. <laughs> now, Darrow gets away with it because the, the phrases in his music don't require him to have any more breath than he does. But what would happen if you stood up straight? Yeah. He's behind the table right now, so he, you, you can't see what I get to see, but come here to the side here. Now stand just the way you were standing when you started. No, that's not the way you were standing. You were standing like this. I had this problem for several years where I had this 20-pound cannonball right out front. <laughs> No, it's actually, what I was talking about was your, the use of your, the way the, that you put your weight. Now, I'm going to turn sideways here. You can notice that when that happens, what happens to the body? What happens to the rib cage? Now, Daryl can get away with it, as I said, because his phrases aren't so long. But if Daryl were to do that for the three-hour dance, first thing that had happened is that Daryl's back would start to hurt after no time. Second thing that started to happen is that about after about an hour and a half, his throat would start to get tired because there wouldn't be an easy, consistent delivery of air to the throat. So that, those things don't show up in a, just a very brief critique. But, you know, I'm really having to be picky with him because he's so, too good to, to just to, to find something better than that. That's very good there. Thank you. Next is Pat Barber. I wanted to make sure he realized I was a fellow Texan. <clears throat> It's a big state. Well, really? It don't make any difference. Sides, <laughs> face, <laughs> grand How many of you would like to be friends with a voice like that? Yeah, it's a very, very friendly, friendly sound. But it's also a little bit hard to hear. I want you to do that same thing again. All of you, when you were 
young had magnifying glasses that you used to set leaves on fire and scare your parents to death. I want to use the same principle to describe what I'm, I'm going to call focus in singing. When you focus, bogus, no, focus. When, when you focus that magnifying glass by moving it up and down, it takes the beams and refracts them down to where it comes to a very sharp point. And the sharper that point is, the hotter it is, and you can set things on fire. But if you bring it out of focus just a little bit so that the circle of light is rounder, the temperature doesn't get as intense and therefore you don't start a fire. Well, if you, it doesn't take any, you're not using any more sunlight, you're just using that sunlight more efficiently. If you think in that term on using your voice, it doesn't take any more voice to make sound, it does require a more intense focus. And that was one of the things that we were talking about a little bit ago, that when you listen to yourself on the inside, it leaves that sound diffused and therefore it doesn't have an intensity to it. And that's your voice at this point doesn't have intensity. It just has nice friendliness. So that if, you get, if I got these people up making noise, as I did at the beginning, and they seem to enjoy that, they'd have a hard time hearing you. But if you had a sound that cut through that, you'd be surprised how much easier it would be on your voice. So I'm going to ask you again to, to put that sound right up here on the front teeth and feel like you're singing through a little circle that's no bigger than about an inch and a half that includes the tip of your nose and your lips. Okay, and just right through there, very small space. <clears throat> intensity in that sound. Okay. You love to swallow off those ends of words. Yeah, Amarillo by morning. <laughs> <laughs> Side space, grand square. Amarillo by morning. Up from San Antonio. Everything that I've got is just what I've got. Texas sky swing that girl in from day There really are not very many tricks to it. There really aren't very many tricks to being able to do it right. The, what really amounts to the trick is to be able to get them working in your, in your favor instead of against you. One of them is to just get weight out of your voice. Ken Bauer.
don't have any criticism to offer of that except that I couldn't hear you. And that wasn't and that wasn't your fault. Is that record is there some balance mechanism uh, on that? I wish you hadn't brought that out. Uh, it's a test record. It isn't a, a complete record. Oh, I see. Because what I what I got was a whole bunch of instrumental, and I uh, had a hard time hearing you. Did you have that trouble? Uh, well, fellas, you won't have that trouble with the real record. Oh, okay. This is this is not supposed to be a demo tape. <laughs> yeah. Especially if you use the call side. Yeah. We can we can clean it up. I think. Somebody have another record? It's obvious to me. That Ken is from California. Can you hear the difference in the way he uses his voice just a little bit? Everybody has that certain twang that goes along with the whining side of your voice. And those, every person that's been up here so far today has an element of that in their voice. And that's absolutely essential if you're going to be able to project over other noise in any kind of setting that you're in. It has to be there. People criticize that. Now, I'm, most of my colleagues are classical music buffs, so when they hear anything from uh, country western side or from folk dancing side or any of that idiom, they say, oh, that's just so nasal. It isn't just so nasal. It's exactly where it's supposed to be for what it's supposed to do. Okay. Yeah. Give it another shot. day for me if they keep sending me guys that can do it as good as they can. And I hope in our afternoon sessions that we'll have an opportunity to work with some people who have real problems instead of people that I have to look so hard for problems. I, I have just, a, have we got any more? Got one more to go or do I get to get on my soapbox for a minute? I want to get on a soapbox because I'm not sure that I'm going to get all of you back this afternoon. There are plenty of other fun activities. I want to talk to you now as a fellow entertainer. I want to talk to you about getting out and reaching to your audience. You need to own the space of the dance. I, as a performer, go into the opera house or into the musical comedy house an hour before anybody gets there. And I make sure that my spirit, or my psyche, or my mental energy goes out and touches that back wall, and that back wall, and that back wall, and every chair in between. So that when all of you come into this space, you're coming into my territory, and I can welcome you like a gracious guest. And I don't have to enter into your territory and conquer you to get your attention. Now, dancers are going to be coming in, and they're going to be carrying burdens of all kinds on their shoulders, mentally. They're coming to dance to get release from those. And if you are a gracious host and invite them into your space, and then if you will provide that energy, that performance energy, necessary to get them started, they're going to have such fun while they're there that they'll come back again. But if you wrap yourself in a corner with your microphone and perform to yourself and stay aloof of them, they're going to keep those burdens on their shoulders all during that three-hour dance, and they're going to walk out just as tired as they were before they walked in, and two or three times of that, and they're going to say, maybe I'll go bowling or to the movies or something else. The caller has the responsibility as a performer to entertain those people, and he, has to, he or she has to be willing to provide the psychic energy to get that dance started, and once it's started, 
it'll roll by itself and they'll feed you back and you'll get back every ounce of energy you ever put in. Now I had to do, I was doing that this morning and granted, you were already on my side. You were with me so I didn't have to work very hard at it. But everybody, whether they're lecturing or performing, has to be willing to make that commitment. And if you don't want to make that commitment, your dancers will know it. I hope in the sessions that we have this afternoon we can talk a little bit more about that because that's something that I think is very important. We'll be back at 1.30.